Hey church family, welcome to our online Sunday service. You know, even though we're not able to meet in person, this is still a way that we can connect. So I encourage you to watch this whenever you have time to pause, to slow down, and consider this our worship service. I know it looks different and you're going to watch it in your own home or wherever you find yourself. But I recommend the same way that you would have come to church today. You would have set time aside. I encourage you to do the same. And maybe as a family, if you're able to, sit down, watch this together. And I pray that this would really help you during this time. I'm going to pray for us and we'll dive right into it. Father, we thank you that we can connect like this. We thank you that you are still seated on your throne. You are still a righteous and a just God. You rule and reign. Help us to remind, to remember that. Remind us of the fact that you are gracious, you are compassionate, and you are a very present help during times of trouble. And Father, we are facing times of trouble, so we need you. I pray that you will speak to us through the scriptures and use this time to, to ease our fears, to, to calm our souls, our inner being, and help us to find hope, help us to find strength, help us to... To find a bigger perspective, speak to us through your word, in Jesus' name, Amen. So again, thank you for watching this and for joining through this video, and my prayer is that the study will speak to you. We are busy as a church with a study called Fight, Flight, and Faith. I encourage you to maybe go and rewatch some of the previous messages because this is part four of a five-part series and just to give you a little bit of background these concepts that we are studying became a major part of my three-year study for my PhD dissertation and it's so interesting that what I studied and delved into over the course of three years has all of a sudden become very applicable to me personally. All of a sudden, the things that I studied and read and wrote about, now I, I can literally, literally go back and reread what God showed me two years ago, a year ago, and it's comforting to me from His Word and what others have found. So the bigger question was, the bigger question of my study was, how does faith help us? to cope with stress. It's called spiritual coping. The sub-question was, does faith help us during difficult times? And the answer is resoundingly yes. Faith is available to help you during difficult times. So during this season that we find ourselves in, a global threat, uh, an invisible enemy, as you've heard it called, Faith really becomes very important now. So I hope that during this study, you will find some practical tools and that the Holy Spirit will give you some light bulb moments to find ways to use your faith to handle this stressful time that we're all under. And um, we're going to study the life of Peter, but this unfolded. In the Garden of Eden, we studied that last week, and then we, we saw how Adam and Eve all of a sudden started fighting and fleeing. They were hiding from God, flight. They were blaming one another. All of a sudden, there's tension, fight. God identifies that there is an enemy. It's the snake. It's the serpent. And he said, I am going to fight this enemy on your behalf. The seed of the woman, the head-crushing seed of the woman, is going to come and fight for you. 
But then we looked at how the fall of humanity affected the next generation, Cain and Abel, the first historical tragedy where mankind turns and self-destructs. And it's, it's a tragedy. And I want to revisit just a few of those points from last week leading into David's outline of how he said, I want to fight, I want to flee, but I turn to faith, and then parallel it with the life of Peter. So just to, um, to revisit what we studied last week, in Psalm 55, 22, David says, you know, it is possible to give your burdens to the Lord, and He will take care of you. That's called spiritual coping. That's called using your faith. But last week we said, fight. It's important to identify the real enemy. Fight. Confront the real problem. And faith, pause to find a real solution. So, let me remind you. There is an enemy. And sometimes, fight and our fight response is a good thing. There are worthy causes to fight. We fight for survival. We fight for justice. We fight oppression. We fight anything that tries to hurt and destroy or damage you and your family. Yes, we're going to fight that. That's built into us for survival. But please know that it's important to fight the right battle. And that's why the second part of flight confront the real problem, we saw how Adam, all of a sudden, he, he flees his responsibility and he says, well, God, it's the woman that you gave me. So he, he avoids his own responsibility in their wrongdoing. And then he identifies the woman as the enemy, and he even identifies God as a threat. He said, well, you gave me this woman. So, let me remind you. I need everybody to listen to this. There is an enemy. Husband and wife, the enemy is not your spouse. Cain and Abel. Cain, the enemy was not your brother. That was not the problem. So let us remember today, the people around us, that's not our enemy. Because we're fighting an invisible enemy, an invisible threat, please be careful not to take it out on the visible people around you. Your brother and your sister, your family members, they are not your enemies. We are in this together. And especially as the body of Christ as Christians. You know, Cain asked this question. He said, almost sarcastically, am I my brother's keeper? Well, Jesus came and answers that. Paul comes and answers that. As the body of Christ, we are our brother and our sister's keeper. We need one another. So just remember that. There is an enemy, but it's not the people in your household. And I hope that part of this study will help you to keep the peace in your home, because we need peace. We cannot turn on one another. If we're already under stress and pressure, Lord, help us to keep the peace in our homes. Now, faith says, pause to find a real solution. So here are three thoughts. How is your faith going to help you this coming week? The first thought there is soul care. We need to feed our souls. Here's a practical example. Think about how much time I spend watching the news and getting the latest updates compared to how much time do I spend reading and studying the good news? 
Bible study, prayer. You've heard the concept of 555. Five minutes of worship to start your day. Five minutes of reading scripture. And then five minutes of reflecting. Soul care. Start your day like that. David says, morning, noon, and night, I pray to you, Lord. So we especially need to make sure that, that we balance out what we feed into our minds. Take care of our thought life. Take care of our emotions. Secondly, protect the peace. Pray this prayer. Lord, help me to keep the peace in my home. Help me to find inner peace. And help me to get along with those around me. Help me to protect the peace. And then another thought is life rhythms. You know, we find ourselves in a time where our regular schedule for a lot of people have changed. And now is a good time for you to revisit what's the best way to, what's the best way to plan my day? And just think about it. how are you going to start your day? What can you do in the morning to start your day right? And then what is the next week going to look like? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And just ask the Lord to help you with that. Because for a lot of people, the regular schedule is not an option now. And be proactive. Say, Lord, help me. Um, like I said, help me to start my day worshiping you, studying the Bible, time of reflection. Build that into your day. Maybe a time of prayer as a family together, praying for protection. Maybe taking communion as a family together. Those are just examples. Doing a Bible study together. Maybe watching something inspirational or watching a, a movie that's going to encourage you. And just finding that day-to-day -day rhythm. In a sense, we are forced to go backwards in terms of, you know, think about when families used to just live on a farm. And it was just the sun comes up, I wake up, the rooster crows, I start my daily routine, I eat my lunch, I do my afternoon jobs, and then evening comes and things kind of quiet down. We need to find a good rhythm because otherwise your days are going to be very long and very stressful and it's going to become overwhelming. So just a practical suggestion. Say, Lord, help me to plan my days and to find a rhythm that's going to work for us. And man, do we need God's grace and mercy and compassion and patience and kindness right now so you know we need a miracle all of us Lord do a work in my heart so that I'm a nice person to be around and so that everybody in my inner circle can just find peace protect that peace so hopefully that helps you now let's continue by looking at the life of Peter now again the outline is Psalm 55, and we're going to parallel what David experienced with, with Peter's life. And I call this Peter's Transformational Faith Walk, but this is similar to our Transformational Faith Walk. So three things we're going to look at. Fight. Avoid impulsive overreaction. Flight. Avoid continual denial. And faith. Find grace-filled restoration. So let's go to Psalm 55. Here's David's outline. And you're going to see how neatly he describes the fight, the flight, and the faith response. Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by my troubles. My heart pounds in my chest, the terror of death assaults me. Fear and trembling overwhelm me. I can't stop shaking. David is describing what is built into us, the, the basic fight response 
when I am overwhelmed, when I, when I sense a threat, my body responds. My eyes, my senses tells me, my ears tells me, this is a threat. It sends signals to the brain, the brain tells the heart, start pumping blood. Because we need our muscles to, to, to be able to respond quickly. And that's why when you are really upset, you can literally start shaking. That's one response, the fight response. There are times when we need that to kick in. Now, here's the second response. Verse 6. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, then I would fly away and rest. I would fly far away to the quiet of the wilderness. So the second response is the flight response. There are times when this is a very valid and good option. When you sense a threat, just think about when you're out in nature and there's a threat, there's a bear, a lion, a tiger, a snake, run, run, flee that thing. And that's built into us. Now, what we're going to see is you cannot constantly default to fighting or constantly default to fleeing. Sometimes, Peter, you need to put your sword down. And sometimes, Peter, you need to confront the challenge in front of you. You cannot just deny and deny and deny. So there, this is where faith comes in. In verse 11, David says, everything is falling apart. Threats and cheating are rampant in the streets. And then he talks about even being betrayed by a close friend. And we're going to look at when you feel overwhelmed and you lose perspective to the point that you start saying everything is going wrong. That's when you need your faith. So verse 16 Here's the faith response. But I will call on God and the Lord will rescue me. Morning, noon, and night I cry out in my distress and the Lord hears my voice. He ransoms me and keeps me safe from the battle waged against me, though many still oppose me. Verse 22. Give your burdens to the Lord and He will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. Now, Let's look at the life of Peter. John 18, 4. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? This is the arrest in the garden. They reply, Jesus of Nazareth. Now look at this. Jesus said, I am he. Judas the traitor was standing there with them. So Jesus understands what it's like to feel hurt by somebody close to you. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. That's tremendous power this, uh, displayed right there. Now let's look at Peter. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. That's fight response. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Verse 17. This is Peter starting to deny. You aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. Look at his response. I am not. Verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied the second time, saying, I am not. One of the high priest servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged them. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. John 21, 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, 
take care of my sheep. The third time he said to, Simon, said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was heard because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So let's study Peter's transformational faith walk, which is similar to our transformational faith walk. Fight, avoid impulsive overreaction, flight, avoid continual denial, and faith, find grace-filled restoration. So first one, fight, avoid impulsive overreaction. Psalm 55.5, David says, Fear and trembling overwhelm me, shaking, to the point that I'm shaking. Everything is falling apart. John 18, 6. Peter is with Jesus. Jesus says, I am he. And when he said that, he, he demonstrates tremendous power. Yet Peter feels like, he needs to take things into his own hands and pull his sword. So let's look at these concepts. There are times in life when your fight response is a good build-in defense mechanism. But what you need to understand is sometimes we can get stuck in that fight response. So... Do you know anybody, it seems like they are always tense and you are, you know, the term walking on eggshells because you don't know how to approach them because you feel like they're going to snap back at you, you know, for anything you say. You just want to bring them some coffee and you're nervous and you, or you, you know, maybe somebody you work with, you're supposed to go and talk to them about the report and you, you're so nervous because you don't know how are they going to snap back at me? Well, that's unhealthy. And this is a good time for all of us to, to reevaluate our response and say, am I maybe like Peter in a place where I impulsively overreact? And that's some good soul searching to do. And then say, Lord, help me. When I feel my heart pounding, when I sense that I'm shaking and trembling, is this the best time for me to respond? You know, is this a life threat? Because that's why your heart's pounding. It's helping you to fight that threat. But uh, a conversation with a co-worker, a conversation with a family member, is that truly life-threatening? But I'm shaking. I'm ready, you know. I'm ready. Well, chronic defensiveness, it, it's bad for your health. I mean, it just is. That's, that's why high blood pressure is so strongly related to stress. Because your body is supposed to respond and send those signals and you're ready to respond and, and fight if necessary. But then the body also needs to relax again. You cannot constantly be so tense. That's why maybe, you know, if you're in a, a tense situation and before you know it, you know, you're so balled up and, you know, that next day you wake up and all your muscles hurt. Well, the body isn't built to just be in that constant mode of overreacting. So what's interesting here is... Peter was a fighter, and Jesus knew that when he called him. And everybody needs that, that fight instinct. There are times when you need to rise up and you need to fight something. Fight the right fight. We fight the fight of faith. We fight the good fight of faith. But a strength that's overextended can become a weakness. And, and here we see an example where Peter has a lot of good qualities. He was a great leader. But he also had some flaws. So what can be a strength can become a weakness where here Jesus is confronted with 
the inevitable, being arrested and entering his time of suffering. He demonstrates right there. Let's read that again. John 18. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, in the original translation, and some Bibles still have it, where it's, he, he responded, I am. I am. That's God's name. When he spoke that, there was so much power behind that, that this whole army that came to arrest him, tough soldiers, the best of the best, the best squad that they could get together, they fell back to the ground. I am he, boom. So he is superior. He has all the power, yet he went to the cross like a lamb, to the slaughter. So... He had all the power to override them, but he willingly laid down his life. And he demonstrated that they're basically, okay, guys, you're coming to arrest me. Just know that I am, I might be a human, I might be the son of man, but I'm also the son of God. And I have access to the kingdom of heaven that is far superior and, and so much bigger than any human threat. But I willingly lay down my life. I allow you to arrest me. But look at Peter. Even though he saw that demonstrated, he pulls out his sword. And what's interesting, it said, Then Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck. So it's like he was ready. He's a fighter. He's got that sword tucked in. He's ready. Almost looking for a fight. And he's like, here's a threat. And he responds in a way that wasn't helpful during that time and was truly outside of God's will for Jesus. So he wants to step in and defend Jesus. Remember when Peter even stepped up, bucked up to Jesus and rebuked him when he started talking about his suffering. That didn't go well because Jesus said, Peter... You don't even know what you're talking about now. So that was part of his nature. And maybe you're a fighter by nature. Remember, that can be a tremendous strength. But if it is impulsive, it can become a weakness. So here is some very good advice from the Psalms. Psalms 4.4 Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. So this is for the fighters out there. When you sense that you experience what David describes in Psalm 55, my heart's pounding, I'm shaking, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Pause, pause, and be quiet. Now, when you feel threatened, that's tough to do. It takes a lot of self-control. But what I've seen in my own life, you know, I'm normally fairly calm, but every now and then my buttons get pushed and I'm shaking and I'm ready to unleash, you know, the fury of Steve. I have seen that most of the times when I overreacted like that, the results weren't good. And then you, then I had to go back and apologize and try and mend relationships and so this is a good lesson to me when you feel you feel that fight response your blood's boiling press the pause button that's what david says think about it he even says think about it overnight you know isn't it amazing how time can help give us perspective and he says also be silent like don't don't just speak what's on your mind now because that can take a already tense and bad situation and your words can quickly make it way worse. So think about it. This doesn't mean you avoid it. This doesn't mean you're not going to confront it. But breathe, think about it, and then come back where you're in the right frame of mind to have that conversation 
to confront what needs to be confronted, to share your views, and you've got better perspective. Okay, so Peter pulled his sword. Jesus says, okay, Peter, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but now you are overreacting. And this is actually a flaw of you, Peter. I want to use your fighting spirit. You're going to fight for the right cause. But right now, put away your sword. Okay. So let's look at Peter's flight response. And isn't it interesting that he flipped from one extreme to the other, where he denies Jesus three times. In Psalm 55, 7, David says, you know what, sometimes I just feel like I want to fly far away. What we've said is the problem with continual avoidance, continual denial, continual blame shifting is you find yourself in the wilderness. You find yourself in a barren place. You find yourself isolated and nothing, nothing bears fruit. So that is not ideal. There are times when you have to run. There are times when you have to flee, run from the threat, remove yourself. That's healthy. But avoid making that your default where you continually flee, when you continually denial. So here we see Peter going from, I'm ready to fight and cut ears off, to three times denying Christ. I am not, I am not, and again Peter denied it, and he said, I am not, I'm not one of them. So there's a balance, and I know my nature is to, to avoid. Just by nature, I don't like conflict. I just know, even as a child, I mean, I, I had this experience even in high school when there was this fight at school and I remember I just kind of stood on the outskirts and even just the sounds of two guys fighting, it was so upsetting to me. It was, it was, it was disturbing. So now I know there are certain personalities, they the fighters, but I just know by nature, I'm going to avoid it. I've shared with you how not too long ago, I went over here to the store to go get me a drink. And the, the moment I walked in, there was somebody about to fight the cashier over their lottery ticket. And I stopped. And I immediately turned around and I said, you know what? I can go buy a Sprite somewhere else. I don't want a Sprite that bad that I might end up in somebody else's fight. Now, I believe that there are times when we have to follow the advice that we just read in the Psalms. You pause, you avoid the conflict for a moment. And there are times, like I said, if you're in a hurtful relationship, for example, or if you are continually being threatened by somebody, or you find yourself in a life-threatening circumstance, flee, run. That's part of our survival instinct. And that is good for us. However, to habitually avoid conflict is also unhealthy. Because I know in my own life, I can avoid it, ignore it, but that frustration builds up. And then, you know, I'm almost the opposite of Peter where I will deny, deny, deny. And then I want to pull out my sword all of a sudden. And like I said, then I regret what I said. And then I need to apologize. And unfortunately, that has happened in my life where even in church relationships, you know, I felt threatened by something somebody said, and at first I just ignored it, ignored it, never engaged in a healthy um, conversation about it. And then I know at times I overreacted, and it wasn't positive. So, Lord, help me. Lord, help us all 
to find that balance, to confront what needs to be confronted. So again, let's look at what Peter does. He goes to the complete opposite and he denies and he denies and he denies. That's not helpful. That doesn't benefit us. So what we need is healthy ways to confront problems. And look, this is a work in progress. We all need help in the relational aspects and having healthy conversations. So it's not good for you to constantly be ready to fight. It's also not good for us to constantly want to run away. And we just need to find it's a case by case scenario where you got to ask the Lord, what's the best response here? Okay. And that's where our faith comes in. Find grace filled restoration. In Psalm 55 17, David says, Morning, noon, and night I cry out to the Lord. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is our faith response is ongoing it is a process and every day every morning i need god's help and maybe in the afternoon i need to pause and i need to pray again about just the challenges of that morning and then in the evening give my cares to the lord so that i can have a good night's rest and this could be a good um, practice this is not easy but think about the next few weeks. Can you find a way to get quiet in the morning, pause in the afternoon, and then end your day in some form of reflective prayer mode? Good things will come from that. This doesn't come easy, but Lord help me to, to find even my rhythm of giving my cares to you. Start my day by giving my concerns to you. In the middle of the day, look at, Lord, this is how the day has gone so far. I really need your help in this area. Or I'm really grateful for what you've done this morning. And then same thing in the evening. Kind of pause, reflect, look back, and then pray for a good night's rest. In John 21, 15, we see this beautiful picture of Jesus coming to Simon Peter. Now this is after he had cut the guy's ear off. After he had denied Christ three times, he heard the rooster crow. Peter was at a very low point. And if you can study the whole dynamic there, when he saw Jesus on the shore, he jumped off the ship and he rushed. Jesus came to Peter and Peter rushed to be reconnected with Jesus. And he, he asked him these three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter replies three times. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus reinstates Peter to his calling. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. What a beautiful picture of restoration. Now, remember Peter's walk, an example, is applicable to our lives. So even after Peter had completely gone to two extremes, overreacting and then completely denying, and he found himself in a very low place, Jesus comes to him. Listen, during our times of distress, God always comes to us. In the garden, right after the fall, God comes to his creation and says, where are you? And that's still true. That's the gospel message. Jesus is coming to you in your low place, in your fear, in your, your uncertainty, even in your regret. We can only imagine that Peter might have had a lot of regret for denying Christ. And he, Jesus comes to him. And here's the beautiful thing about Peter. That's kind of where that, that fighting spirit is like, I'm going to rush to get to Jesus. And what a, what a beautiful lesson for all of us. 
Run to God, not from Him. Because He's going to keep showing up and you run to Him. And when you mess up, that's grace. He gives you a second chance. You get up, you run to God. Run to Him. Run to Him. So listen, we can practice this this week. Morning, noon, and night. We have an opportunity to pause, reevaluate. Did I maybe overreact? Lord, forgive me. Did I maybe avoid a difficult conversation? Lord, help me. And know that God is right with us in this trying time. He is right there with us. The resurrected Jesus shows up. And then he starts showing Peter that, look, Peter, you are not disqualified. I have more for you. And he tells him, feed my sheep. Peter, you are going to be a leader in the New Testament church. And your life up to this point, it has been preparation for what's to come. And then we see Peter truly in Acts Again, that, that fighting spirit, that boldness. He just stands up and he becomes a major leader to the church in the book of Acts. And that's what we need to remember, that God is a God of grace. Every morning His mercies are new. And when we mess up, when we pull out our sword and overreact, we can go to God. And he can help us with that. And it's an ongoing process. And the same way, when, when we are afraid and we want to avoid maybe having some difficult conversations, he can give us the boldness and the wisdom and the guidance. So, same with Peter. We believe that God has a role and a plan and a purpose for each one of us during this time as his children. We carry His light. We carry His hope. You, your past does not disqualify you. It prepared you for what He has for you next. So let's think about the following thought. During the season leading up to Easter, I want you to think about the faith practice of sanctification. Now 2 Corinthians 1.10 gives us an interesting understanding of time and salvation. I want you to look at the works of Jesus. What does it mean for us, past, present, and future? St. Corinthians 1.10 says, Jesus Christ delivered us, He does deliver us, and He will still deliver us. It's past, it's once and for all, it's present continues, it's day to day, Lord deliver me. And then we have a future hope, He will deliver us. And times like this also remind us to have an eternal perspective, that ultimately God is King on His throne in heaven. And when it's all said and done, Revelation 12, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony and by not loving our own lives. So here are three prayers. We say, Lord, sanctify us. We want to engage in the faith practice of sanctification. Think about Peter. Think about your own life. Three prayers that you can pray morning, noon, and night. Father, forgive me. And then fill in the blank. Father, forgive me. Father, Restore me, just like Jesus came to Peter. And he gives him a chance, even though he denied Jesus three times publicly, Jesus gives him the chance three times to, to affirm his faith. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know all things. And so that's restoration. And then thirdly, Father, equip me, help me. And, and Jesus comes to Peter and says, You have been in training. Go feed my sheep. Go take care of my church. So let's all pray those prayers right now. We'll, I'll lead you in a time of prayer. But again, think about this coming week, morning, noon, and night.
Just build that into your day-to-day -day rhythms. A moment to pause and reflect and look back and look forward and say, Lord, I need your forgiveness and, and run to God. Run to God. Maybe you need to have a conversation with somebody close to you and say, forgive me. I am so sorry. Forgive me. I was wrong. And that takes a tense situation and it starts healing it and making it better. And let's be open to receive forgiveness, to accept that forgiveness, and then to extend forgiveness. As children of God, this is a crucial time for us to extend grace and to extend mercy to the people closest to us. Lord, help us with that. Make that your prayer. Lord, help me with the people around me because they are not my enemy. They're not the enemy. Help us to stay together. We need one another. And then say, Lord, restore me. Help me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew the right spirit within me. That's what the psalmist said. And, and equip me, Lord. Help me to learn from my past mistakes, like Peter, and help me to embrace what you have for me. Equip me for the purpose you have for me. Let me pray for you and your household right now. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the life of Peter. Jesus, I thank you for how you as the resurrected Savior, went to Peter when he was confused and upset and angry and frustrated and disappointed and he wanted to default to his old life as a fisherman. You came to him and said, Peter, you are not disqualified. I have great plans for you. And I need your personality. I need you to be who I made you to be. And I've just been molding and shaping you. Thank you that that's true for us too. Thank you that our past failures do not disqualify us. Thank you that we can bring our guilt, our shame, our regrets to you. Thank you that you forgive. Help us to receive your forgiveness. And then help us to extend that to others. So Father, this is my prayer for every household and for every family. Protect our relationships. Give us your peace. Father, we thank you that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And I plead the blood of the Lamb over every household, over every family. I pray that you will keep us safe, Lord. Protect us, keep us healthy, keep us whole. We look to you during times like this. David said it best. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.